Sean McLaren, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Rob, thanks very much, mate. It's good to be in speaking to you in this capacity, I guess, and not Absolutely. through a WhatsApp voice note or a, a quick call on the back of the year one. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think today it's all around subjectives, RPE, questionnaires, and just max helping people maximize the time, effort that they're putting in, but also their athletes are putting in. But before we dive into that, do you want to give us a bit of background on yourself, what you're doing now, and then maybe work backwards or uh, or vice versa? Up to you. Sure. I feel like um, I feel like I'm sort of back to my roots now in in a couple of different ways. So I'm uh, I'm an S and coach at Newcastle Falcons, who are a Premiership rugby union team in uh, northeast of England, UK. Um, I, I predominantly work in the academy that are under 18s and sort of getting them ready for that for that senior. Uh, environment. Um, I, I interned at the club like ten, maybe eleven seasons ago. Um, starting out as an S and T coach when I was doing a lot in and around with um, Olympic sports and um, youth sport, like female football and um, uh, things like that. So um, I, I had, uh, I always had, the, you know, like been from the northeast and been someone who followed rugby union. I always had this kind of idea that. Um, it would be so cool to to get up there at the club, and when when I did, I was like, wow! And um, I was almost scared to put myself in a position where I could potentially apply for a job because I felt like I was so inexperienced and I didn't really I hadn't really done anything. And um, what if I was lucky enough to get a job there? And after five six years, I was like, God, I just need to. I feel like I need to explore other things, and I didn't want to waste that because I I saw it as a bit of an end game sort of thing. So. Um, here I am, ten years later. Whether it's the end game or not is to be continued. Um, but yeah, I, I sort of started off as an S and C coach, and I'm, I'm very much back into that full throttle now. Um, but the the time and the bit in the middle, particularly sort of like the mid in around like 2015, um, I probably drifted a lot more over to the sports science side of things. And if, if we've been sort of separating one from the other, and I, I would I would say S and C is more in the way of um, programming, delivery, and coaching. And then sports science been kind of monitoring evaluation um, a little bit more around the strategic thinking uh, R and D stuff. Um, even though the reality is, is it's not there's not a clear border. It's just a murky bit of grey in the middle, and you always float between you always float between the two. Um, so yeah, after after I finished my my internship at the club, um, that's when I finished my masters, and um, an opportunity came up to study a, a PhD at Teesside Uni with um, Dr. Matt Weston and. and Profi and Spears. So I began that and I think the title was something like Sports Performance and Injury Prediction Using Mobile Technology. So for a year I sort of figured out what the hell I was going to try and do for that um, until it got to the point where um, like that was the funded project but I found that Matt and myself were having more and more conversations around subjective measures and in particular RPE um, and differential RPE at the time. Um, and the pendulum quickly swung to the other way. Ian's a biomechanist and a, a by trade and a sort of bit of a computer programmer by hobby. Um, so we managed to twist his arm and, and change the focus of this PhD. And that's when um, uh, then head of performance at the Falcons, Andy Smith, went down to Nottingham Rugby. Um, and he called me and he said, look, like I'm on, I'm on my own here. And there's, there's a bit of a blank canvas, if an opportunity, if you want to work with it. And the two just sort of married up really well, where I could spend half my week um, working in Nottingham under Andy, leading more on the sports science things. And then the other half of the week was spent um, trying to make a bit more sense of what we were doing on a day-to-day basis with very much a focus on on collecting um, subjective uh, subjective measures that, that I'd had probably quite a little bit of experience and exposure to um, at the time. Um, but that kind of took me all the way through to 2016, 17. And in my last year of my PhD, I moved over to, to the dark side. So I went to football uh, for, a, for a short 18 months at Hartlepool United Sorry, um, man. before I got sacked. And I do actually have you to, to <laughs> thank for that. Um, I, I will put on the record and say that it was an extremely difficult time for the club going into administration and close to liquidation. With that comes the inevitable, uh, where can we save a few pennies? But um God, I learned a lot about what sport's really about then and, and um, uh, who sort of has you by the noose. Um, and then I had, a, I had some opportunities to, to join up with the RFL and Great Britain Rugby League. And I was there for a couple of years and, and done a tour down under. And that was 
you know, sort of like real eye opening again, like life changing stuff. And it's great to see those those lads now having hit out in the World Cup and, and doing well. So fingers crossed for them uh, in the quarters against PNG next week. Um, through kind of COVID, I was sort of floating around in a bit of no man's land, like like everybody else, and uh, like various bits of consultancy came up with uh, the Premier League and, and NBA uh, playmaker that I was I was really grateful for before. Uh, I had a call from the guys at the Falcons to say, look, there's an opportunity that's came up here. Um, we're assuming it's a no because of where we think you would probably want to come in at versus what this post is. And uh, yeah, I just had a couple of honest conversations with them and I said, look, I'm, I'm internally motivated by this and I, I, I don't feel like anything's beneath me by no means. And um, the opportunity to get back involved at the club would be, you know, I'd absolutely love to. And, and that sort of took me back to it there. Then I'm back in into s and uh, delivery, sort of really looking after our athletic development stuff from, we effectively start at 14 with our sort of outreach type programmes uh, in the DPP before they come into us at 16 and then um, send a few up to the to the senior academy and first team at 18, yeah, so that's uh, that's where I've been. Nice, mate. That's what I've been up to. It's good. It reminded me of that. I forgot about that Hallipool thing. Every time you mention it, I would get together and you mention it, it yeah, it makes me smile, but... <laughs> I have to apologise. I do have to apologise. No, I made, I made some. I made some great uh, friends there. I made some great enemies who are now friends. Also, they say uh, <laughs> I learned a hell of a lot, man. God, I learned a hell of a lot uh, about the the cutthroat end of it. And Christ, we were kicking around in the conference then. So um, hats off to people that that continually do this. You know, at a at a real like you know Premier League type world stage level. Um, but yeah, it, it was also, um, you know, a lot of what happened there was to do with the, the situation that the club was in financially and, and the effect that that had on everyone and everything to the type of hello that you got off people in the morning. Um, and obviously I see a lot of this going on now at, um, from a financial point of view in terms of what's happening at Wasps and Worcester in, back in my sport in, in Rugby Union and, uh, you know, feel for all the players and staff there the tough time that, that they're going through because I can, I can certainly uh, empathise with it. Right, let's dive into the uh, to the meat of the conversation. So RPEs, it was it was interesting. Just to, to caveat the the first question, there was a little bit of a discussion, let's say on Twitter in the last couple of days. Franco and a few others weighing in on yeah. on on this uh, exact topic. And one of the questions that came up was, which I'd like to love to get your thoughts on, was what is this data really telling us? Do people understand what they're actually rating? Is it effort? Is it fatigue? Is it a myriad of different things that it could possibly be. So, what are we actually trying to get from an RPE? Yeah, so there's a there's a few things here, and and, and the first one is, do people understand what? Like the short answer is no, um, and and it, it's like the whole Dun Kruger thing, where like if you'd have asked me ten years ago, do people understand what RPE is, and I went, oh no, it's just a subjective measure, and then I learn a little about it, and and then if you asked me five years ago, I'd say, oh yeah, it's definitely this. It's like there's no question, it's that. It's just, it's just do it. It's that. If you ask me now, I'm like, oh shit! Like it could be so many different things. And this is because, like, if I try and separate it out in terms of um, what we're trying to measure versus what we can measure, um, it, it can come, become a very semantic um, discussion and and conversation. But the reality is, is if you ask somebody um, how hard or how difficult was that, or even just more general, how did you feel about that? That is such a wide and, and broad question that can be interpreted in so many ways. And when you talk about RPE, that, that middle word, P, perception, a lot of it comes down to that and what we perceive. Um, so I try and really break this down, right? And um, this isn't a, an exact science because there's other people who have different opinions on it than, than I do. Um, a great a great example and someone who, I, who I've been speaking to really regularly lately is um, Israel Harplin. Um, we're both really interested in this and trying to understand it a bit more. But we potentially come at certain aspects of it from different angles, if not trying to reach the same end goal. Um, so, so I've really enjoyed it, been engaged in those conversations because it kind of challenges you to keep thinking about it. Um, I, I like, look, I work in sport, and and it's my job to to understand how my athletes are responding, coping with, performing in, um, reacting to training. So that's where the monitoring side of it comes in. So we're talking about training load monitoring, and we can argue. And we currently are about what training load is or it isn't maybe. Um, but for me, it, it's it's the it's the amount of training done 
by athletes, done or, or experienced by athletes. And we go, okay, externally is what they were doing and kicking around and running and internally is then how they um, how their body acutely dealt with that during exercise. And we know that that's the stuff that causes a training effect or response and that's what drives adaptation or maladaptation, the things that we should be in control of from a physical point of view. So for, for me, internal load is what we're trying to get at, understanding that it's actually this kind of real global concept that could be lots of different things. Um, and then in that sense, RPE, or, or in particular, the, the effort side of it, or the perception of effort, becomes the surrogate measure for internal load. And, and you know, you can debate this till the cows come home. I, I, I look at it quite simply in terms of what should it be reflective if we get the question right? And it's that it's the body's internal response to exercise or during exercise. Um, and, I, and I lean very heavily on, on the great work, you know, that was done by people like Chen in 2002 and recently John Lee to, to know that actually when, when people supposedly get it right in studies and they measure things that we'd love to measure, like uh, oxygen uptake and blood lactate and heart rate and muscle electrical activity to EMG, when they go up, our people's perception of effort or exertion also concurrently goes up. So all of a sudden I'm like, here's some internal things that I'm interested in because I think they represent certain levels of um, intensity or, or if you like stress. And again, I'm using words now that a lot of people will go, no, but stress is a different thing. And so you can't, you, you always like feel like you're treading on eggshells with it. But I just try and really strip it back and be like, I'm interested in, in the internal load of, of my athletes when they're training. There's things I can't measure, but I think RPE gives me a good reflection of that if I can collect it right. And and I guess what we're trying to measure, you've got three things. It's a rating, so that means that we're actually trying to um, do some some numerical, oh yeah, it was this one, that one, that one, um, or perceived, and that means it's 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 up to me to decide it's it's what's there in my head, um, and exertion or effort. Now, there's people who would argue that exertion and effort are different things I think for me that that becomes too much of a semantic discussion because we spend too much time talking in and around what why it may or may not be and it just stops you from actually doing anything that might have a bit more of an impact. So I use that interchangeably. Other people don't. But but I, I think in my opinion, effort is clearly an exertion. They're in one bucket, and that bucket is what I want to measure because I think it I think I think it's related to other of the you know internal things during exercise that I'd like to quantify as part of my athlete monitoring. That's distinctly different from other exercise-induced perceptions that can be very highly related to that effort exertion bucket. And this is like the perception of fatigue, which which I would, would loosely or broadly think of in terms of um, the overall capacity to perform work or, or that, that feeling of you're crossing in the water of, tiredness and and you know discomfort um pleasure enjoyment pain all of these other things that probably happen on some varying level when effort is experienced um and what you're trying to do is is really be clear and separate one from the other so in terms of what we're trying to measure i said you can split it down into a few things and for me it comes to well that's what i'd like to measure it's the effort slash exertion side of things and i think it's because um for me measured measured right um, it can be a good proxy for internal training load. Either uh, if you talk about it in a pure sense, it's a measure of intensity, or if you look at it multiplied as a rating by duration, and that's proper, you know, load as as you know people might think of it. But that's distinctly different from all these other things. And and what I realise is that actually, if you don't have this conversation with athletes, um, they they're not very good intuitively at understanding what some of the subtle differences are between like uh no no that was pain like oh well do you know what it was all right so i'm probably i'm looking at a four but like my knee was just killing me so i'd definitely say it was a six and and the realization i had with this stuff is when um collecting rpe face to face with people holding up a scale it just opens up an avenue for those conversations and you see the ones that some of them like really engage with it and they almost overthink it but that's when you can understand like no no that's probably pain i don't want you to think about the pain in your knee I want you to think about um, how easy or hard it was to drive your leg muscles while you were running or how easy and or hard it was to to, to breathe, for example. Um, so giving them kind of like almost reference points to, to anchor on because I'm wanting to, it's a, it's a cognitive measure, but actually I'm interested in the physical because that's what I'm responsible for. 
So I try and like really sharpen the blade and, and, and go down down to that with it. But that full face-to-face kind of collection is where you get all these great little um, nuances and, and frustrations sometimes. Um, you know, like, because you, you sort of feel when, or you understand when people are just chucking a number at you and they're not engaging with it. Um, but then sometimes and actually when they when they are and, and you can really sort of see the cogs working, which is which is quite nice. And then you can it opens up a conversation that you can engage with them um, around different things about like we'll do a lot where we'll we'll, we'll ask someone for a rating and then we'll maybe just quiz them on why, and then that gives you a bit of indication about what their thought process was with that and whether it's potentially on the right avenue or not. Um, and do we need to do some education, be it an ad hoc quick response to that now in terms of oh well actually we're thinking of the wrong thing there but next time think a bit more like this we've gone down the recommendations route already so i think it may be best to to, to crack on with that if that's all right so in, you've got face to face hold maybe holding the scale or having the scale there in front of you and my next question would be what scale but what other recommendations would you have for practitioners and i, I want i probably should have framed this at the start and like i'd mentioned to you before we click hit, hit record this on the surface seems like the easiest, simplest, cheapest, it might be the cheapest way to get some data about the responses to training. But there's 99% of people who are listening will not have access to GPS, will not have access to force plates, all these kind of um, tech, fancy tech, and we'll be relying on subjectives to make decisions. So it's just to give some clarity for those people, as well as the 1% who do integrate this within other technologies as well. But when it comes to recommendations, what recommendations would you have for practitioners who want to collect good data? So, so I think w- what we'll do first of all is we'll ignore the scale as the scale being its own entity, knowing that um, I have an opinion on it, but um, uh, other scales are available. <laughs> it's like what you have to say when you're on the BBC. Um, so. I think, first of all, understanding exactly what you want to measure and, and differentiate and separate um, and having absolute clarity in that. And I've just talked through that process of like where I work from. I want to measure internal load. I understand that's a construct that actually I need some some indicators of that. The reason I choose RPE is because of its association with all of these other in, internal load indicators. And OK, now I then I, I want to clearly separate that as a perception from fatigue and effort and discomfort. So I've almost now got a bit of a definition of what I want to try and measure. In RPE, what I don't want to try and measure, and and I think the first thing is probably to try and have that absolute um, sort of clarity on it. I think when when it comes to uh, measuring or collecting RPE, the, the the main thing that you want to try and reduce is what we would call conscious bias, um, and this is basically, I'm a true believer that on a scale from nothing at all to the highest I've ever had, there's there's a near right answer somewhere depending on the type of question that you ask and, and what you're looking for, and Conscious bias is a mismatch between where that theoretical right answer is and the actual answer that you get. And you can split it down into two things. So you've got um, cognitive factors and, and cognitive factors are like um, error that arrives from like um, miscomprehension or, or it's more the mental processing of what we're trying to ask. So the first one is comprehension. Like, do they understand um, what we're trying to measure, which is effort and the reasons why? So an athlete wouldn't have a good comprehension of that based on the definitions and context I gave. If they went, if I said, look, what was your RP for that session? And they went, oh, my legs were really heavy this morning. That So that, so that was that was definitely a, an eight or a nine. So automatically there, they're, they're, they're judging a perception that was nothing to do with how it felt during the session. But what they anticipated the session to be, I've got heavy legs, therefore this will be hard. Well, that's heavy legs is probably somewhere in the fatigue soreness type realm. And that's actually a response to your training load, not your training load, what you did. Um, all right. Do you know what? That was really I, I was buzzing with that session. Every touch I was on it, we were moving. The boys were having a good laugh. Um, yeah, that was uh, yeah, that was easy. That was like a three. Like, no, no, not how much you enjoyed it. Like if you enjoy it, it potentially feels easy. I'm talking about like, again, going back to these reference points of like, well, what about your breathing rate? And what about like, how easy or hard it was to drive your legs. Um, there's loads of other things that can influence um, your, your your cognitive factors. So like recall and timing, whether you're asking it at the end, five minutes after, 10 minutes after, half an hour after, two days after, um, that might not be as um, sensitive as, as maybe we once thought, but I think that timing definitely has a, 
an effect if you go to the extremes. Are so you what, like? But what would you be recommendation there, Sean, for someone? So people say that like, the, the whole, and this was just from like Foster's recommendation of like uh, collect RP thirty minutes after. And the reason why is you don't want to influence what happened at the end of the session to, to bias your rating. You have a pretty easy session and then you have a big hit out at the end for 15, 20 minutes, maybe some con or maybe some sided games. And you ask for an RP straight away. People are going to be like, oh, well, I'm, I'm blowing now. Uh, I was blowing just then. Like I was really going acceleration, deceleration, whatever. Yeah, that was like a seven or eight. Um, whereas actually, if you let that settle and they reflect on the session as a whole, it may be a little lower than that. Um, when, when people have sort of looked at this and tested it empirically, the differences between collecting RPE like 10 minutes after a session are no, not really different, especially not practically different, maybe it's one unit on a scale, to collecting them 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, there's some great work that came out of the guys uh, over in Italy, uh, Rich Fancini, Franco was on that, Cootsy as well, and uh, they looked at like response shift and recall bias. So they asked a lot of footballers their RP after a session, and, and naturally you miss some of them. So two days later, the ones that they asked their RPE, they said, um, can you remember what you give us, and can you recall that? Or they asked them, um, can you re-rate that session that you gave me an RPE for a few days ago? If you can remember what you give me, I'm not interested. I want you to think about the session again and re-rate it. And there was no real difference between whether they tried to recall the specific rating or re-rate the session two days later. Um, that, for me, was something that theoretically I just thought, nah, that won't work. But then you test this stuff out and you go, oh, actually, it's, that's pretty robust. So one way I directly move that into our practice is um, collecting RP after a session. We wouldn't be as stringent as waiting for 30 minutes because I honestly believe that as long as you give it a little bit of time to simmer down, maybe it's five, 10 minutes, you should be good to go. Be careful if you've got some real intense stuff at the end of the session. You maybe want to go up to 15 minutes there. Again, just like a use common sense as a bit of a cooling off period. But that doesn't work for every session. What's the most demanding session? I work in team sports, right? And I, I always have mostly the most demanding. My most demanding train session of the week is, is a match on a, on a Saturday, a Sunday, Wednesday, Tuesday. Um, and believe me, I've tried to be by the book with this and get RPEs in the changing room afterwards. Um, it's great when you've won. When you've not, wow, you put yourself in a real uh, sticky situation there and you get some some real funny looks and some funny responses as well. So I kind of remember seeing that paper by Maurizio and, and I used that to say, right, straight away now, our standard practice for collecting match RPEs is going to be always doing the day after whether we've won or lost because that emotive response is is so high and inflamed. Um, you're right on top of the world because you've won or you're the scale because you've because you've been beat, pumped, narrowly beat, whatever. Um, just you know, for me, do it the day after and, and rely on um, some of the evidence that's out there to suggest that you know that might actually be a better solution than doing it in the changing rooms after a game, trying to keep it in your normal collection window and having all of these affect phenomena, this like kind of again that emotive response um, influence it and and and, uh, and asking it. So those like some of the cognitive uh, factors and like response generations, another one. So like, um, can you, again, can you give people little hints and tips on what you want them to think about? Because if you ask a question, you're just leaving people to their own brain and their own devices, and you can end up in some weird and wonderful places. Um, we've mentioned a lot of them. I again, break this down. And this was one of the reasons why we, we started looking at uh, differential RP. And this was kind of an idea from Matt Weston when he was with the Premier League referees. Um, Matt, Matt tells a great story and he used to look after the referees um, when like Arsenal United was a big game um, and if there's any young Arsenal United fans out there who still think that's a big game grew up when I grew up in the early 2000s and that really was so a big game good. so, so good. yeah that's it that's like top top <laughs> tier um, and that was like you know 2003 2004 Arsenal as well um, and and when Arsenal used to play United Matt used to say that the, the running loads off the then it was pros or would always be the lowest but the rps used to be the highest and he used to speak to the guys about this like howard webb and stuff and be like what's going on here why is that there's a bit of a disconnect here based on what you've done i think that should be a lot lower and they would call and, and refer to things like the, the 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 pressure that they felt building up to the game even through the media um, the hostile uh, environment, uh, then it would have been Highbury or at Old Trafford, the crowd getting on the back, players getting on the back, and that just became such a tense, tight situation. 
So there's clearly this cognitive component that's biasing the rating to go, well, how hard did I find the match? Christ, that was very hard. So this is this is where the idea came from to go, like, what about separating? Well, how hard was it cognitively and mentally? How hard was it on your breathing and your leg muscles? The, the reason why we go breathing leg muscles is because in healthy individuals, they seem to think that the two biggest drivers for something like effort is um, – central and peripheral type exertion so i i I'd sort of put my physiologist hat on and go well again i'm responsible for monitoring training and i care about the cardiovascular system and i understand that that's distinctly different to the neuromuscular musculoskeletal system but i care about that as well so i've got these two different pathways because they have different um adaptation pathways and, and, and response pathways sort of separating out these two and, and it makes a bit more sense now. And, and we, we were going the way then of like asking a score for breathlessness, a score for legs. I actually think now that that should just be part of the cue into athletes and players. So understanding that when I want your RPE, because I'm personally interested in the physical, I want you to mainly think about how easy or hard it was on your on your things like your breathing rate, how easy or hard it was to breathe. Um, and, and that's because people are consciously aware of their breathing. Um if I said to you, like, what's your heart rate? You'd probably go straight to your wrist with two fingers. Um, and then also how easy or hard it was to drive the leg muscles and, like, there's some, like, stuff that talks about like, the strain in the leg muscles. And I, I try not to get too technical with it because um, most athletes that I've worked with, at least, when you give those cues, they in- instinctively go, oh, right, I know now it's not this, not that, not that. So there's all these different cognitive factors that you can, that you can um, consider and manipulate. And that's more in, like, the way you define what you're trying to measure um, and the reference points you give for that. Situational factors, and this is something else that can affect RPE or or basically any subjective measure. This is um, like inaccuracies between where that theoretical right number is on a scale from nothing to everything. I honestly think there's a right answer somewhere. And then the rating that you give, so the mismatch there. Situational factors are like um, deliberate deception. So when people lie to you, when, when people genuinely think it was one thing and they give you another number or they give you a number without thinking about it. And that's normally because of two things. It's, they're either externally motivated or they're internally motivated. So externally motivated is you're, you're my coach and I've done a session and I, I thought it was very hard. Based on the scale you're showing me, that's a seven. Um, but I'm hearing other people give like threes and fours and stuff like that. And actually, I've just came back from an ACL and I'm just working my way back into the team. So no wonder it felt very hard. I'm, I'm probably still a little bit off the mark. But if I elude that information um, based on the relationship that we have, the culture within the team, that might actually get me out of favour, get me dropped, not let me be considered for selection. So I'm going to go, oh, what? That, oh, yeah, it was easy. That was like a three. So you've gone from three to seven. And like do that in terms of like heart rate terms. It's like your heart rate monitor saying, uh, you know, there's a session at 90% max, but it goes, nah, that was 70. You cruising there, man. You got this. <laughs> you wouldn't, you simply wouldn't buy technology if it give you that much error. It doesn't give you that much error because it's hard to do that with heart rate. But how hard is it to do it when it's, it's, it's a, it's a subjective response that I'm giving you. Um, the, the, the last one there is like, um, internally motor deception, whereby that is, um, I'm motivated, but I can't be bothered to come and speak to you with your scale right now. So I'm going to be, yeah, it was a five, it was a five, because I've got other things to do and I want to get off. I want to reduce my time on task. Um, th- th- there's all kinds of different solutions that you can implement in and around those. Um, in terms of breaking down barriers and having access and making it easy for athletes, first of all, don't put them in a situation where it, it's easier for them to lie or respond differently so things that that you would typically avoid for rpe is don't be asking people to shout scores out with you in uh reach of everyone else if you're training on a match day minus one everyone's on the pitch that you're going to play in the next day you're the sports scientist you wait in the tunnel as people go past and you just say john and you go yeah four and then whatever whatever um the other issue there is you're not even showing them the scale again separate conversation but if someone else hears that they're more likely to give what the, the previous person done and again there's evidence to to support this don't do don't do even though it's easier for you don't put a big sheet up with everyone's name and then have a second column that says rp and get them to write it in because people are just going to socially conform to it um try and foster a situation where you can get people in isolation so they really engage with it and 
you might say, but then they're just going to go, yeah, it was a five, and then they're going to deceive me for an internally motivated reason. They need to they need to understand an athlete and to understand and know and, and care enough to go. He he takes it seriously when he's trying to get these scores. Like they genuinely try and do something with it that helps us. Like I I understand that, and no matter what has happened to me right now in the session, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to give you ten seconds of my time because I know how much you believe in this and this means to you. Um, so it's almost trying to um, you've got to show them how much that you that you genuinely believe in it. If you do, um, and if you don't, that'll maybe bleed off into them. And then in terms of having athletes like lie or deceive to you, that doesn't invalidate the measure. So the the equivalent of that example of me saying. I'm coming back from an ACL. Uh, it was a seven, but I'm going to give you a three. I don't personally believe that that's the fault of an RP or a subjective. Because if you think it's their fault, the equivalent of that would be um, my ACL, my knee's actually hurting and I'm coming back from an ACL, but I'm in the mix to, to get to get a start here or get on the bench on Saturday. So the team doctor or team physician is checking, checking me over the physio. And I'm actually getting a bit of pain. Um, and I know that this isn't 100%. And they're like, so how is it? And I'm going, oh, champion. Never, brand new, never been better. So they've lied to the physio, the doctor. Does that make that practitioner invalid or bad at the job? No. So it, it then starts, we're talking about like a bit of a cultural issue and, and how e- easy is it for people and athletes to be honest and open without it having an impact on, it's tough because, that's an extreme example where if someone ain't right, then they're not going to play. So you're, you're probably going to get it and see it, whether it's collecting a subjective or physio or doing an assessment. Um, but I think that, you know, you want, you want, you want to, you probably want to then try and be looking to go, how can we support and encourage an environment where um, people understand that they can be honest with this stuff? Um, it's a bit of a double edged sword because if you play down how important the RPEs are, um, <laughs> then they'll lose the motivation to give you the time and effort to respond accurately. It's a tough one. I've, I've toyed with it for loads of different things. And it, it's, it's, I think it sits, there's a lot of wider issues that sit within that. Um, there's, but yeah, there's, there's some things and some recommendations that you can say, do this, don't do that. Like ask them and pull them on one side or set up a Google form. Don't stick it on the wall and don't be shouting out and asking people in front of others. The other things, again, it's probably wider issues that, require a bit more thought um definitely by someone who's got a bit more sense on it than me because i think i've exhausted everything at the moment you're a modest man you're a very modest man <laughs> so another thing that's very on tre- on topic on trend i suppose it's one thing that's come up very recently and that's the um the type of scale or the v- how the scale looks that has um, come to the fore recently in, in the Twitter thread that I um, mentioned just earlier. Why is it so important to use a particular scale? And you can tell us which particular scale you would you would recommend. And what are the issues with veering away from that, using things like different colours, different descriptors, emojis, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, this is like uh, anyone can go on Google now and type RPE scale and go on Google Images and you'll see what the norm is. Um, the reality is, is that there's lots of way to quantify the perception of uh, an in- a stimulus or an intensity. So when we talk about effort exertion as a, as a surrogate to internal intensity slash training load, um, but this applies to things like noise and uh loudness you know blackness and uh perception of smell stuff like that and there's there's obviously people who've been interested in this for probably i dare say a couple of hundred years now you know like stevens's work goes back um well before my grandparents were born and and originally like there was a couple of ways to do this so people would say like uh right rob how, how hard do you think that was give me give me any number you can give me you can give me absolutely any number that you want there's actually no limit on it but if you give me a 17 now when you do something that you feel is twice as hard as this, it has to be 34 because it's 17 times two. And, and, and then people started thinking, well, actually, it probably makes sense that because then we can't compare Rob to Sean um, because what is Rob's 17 might be Sean's 84 or might be, you know, Jenna's uh, three. So actually, if we put some bounds on it and we maybe say that we've got a bottom and a, and a top, we can make within and between person comparisons um, and it's still this like ratio type level data um it, it's 
look, it comes as no surprise that you, you can't talk about RP without mentioning Gunnar Borg and, and his scales. And um, I could be on here hours talking about this. And I, I feel like I have, I have a semi-qualified opinion to speak about it because I've spent the time going through a lot of his work and the work in and around it and surrounding. And I genuinely believe that when people are advocating stuff like facial expressions or coloured RPE scales or scales that are potentially not his, I don't feel that they have went through the mill with it to the extent that that I potentially have. Um, so it probably sounds stupid to say it's a bit of like a blessing and a curse at the same time. But but to, to, to kind of really just almost try and prove the point without going into like technical details, Gunnar Borg spent like over half a century developing. He, he ultimately ended up with two scales. Um, because I'd be confident enough in saying that um, by the time he got to sort of early 2000s and his daughter Elizabeth had taken on a lot of this work by then and, and, and she was really driving the CR100 scale. Um, I, I think that the Borgs had kind of came to a, a, an agreement that, or an understanding that the 6 to 20 was a great one to get out the blocks. And, and back then it was used as a bit of a proxy for heart rate because times it by 10 and it should be, you know, if I give you an RP of 6, that's at rest. My heart rate is 60 beats a minute. 20 is 200, and that's where you get that from. Um, all the categories are evenly spaced because heart rate increases linearly during continuous exercise. Um, the category ratio scales would, were developed just in light of um, the fact that there's a couple of extra things that confine you with a linear scale and with something like the 6 to 20 scale. So the fact that it has like a, a stop point at the end um, it has that ceiling and people will naturally always try and avoid the ceiling, you know, so like 20 out of 20. Um, and how do you know it is 20 out of 20? What if like your 20 is actually your 19, but you don't know that until you get there. Um, so, so Borg's CR scales and CR stands for category ratio because it, we've got a link between a, a category, you know, being the, the um, verbal descriptor and then the ratio sort of level data. Borg tried to combine a ratio scale with a category scale. And for that, you get the benefit of being able to make these within and between person comparisons by saying, comparing hard with hard or hard with moderate, but then actually signing a numeric value to that that should have sem what, what they would call semi-ratio um, properties. So those start those scales are like open-ended as well. So the CR scale, like the last numeric value that you can give is 11.5. Um, that's on the CR10 scale. So there's this idea that it doesn't really have a ceiling because if, if we have a ceiling for the amount of effort we can exert or experience, I, I doubt that anyone's ever had it in their life. So you've got to think about, you know, like a uh, baby trapped under a car, mother lifts car type um, human, like super strength. That's probably like that 10 out of 10 or 11.5 out of 11.5. But the idea with the open-ended scales is that it doesn't confide you because people always like avoid the ends and they just get people floating around in the middle. Um, the six to 20 scale, again, is you had like easy, moderate, hard, somewhat hard. And, and those verbal anchors like were nicely spaced. I think it was like a two unit interval on the six to 20 scale. You look at the CR scales and I'll use the CR 10 because it's the one that people are most familiar with. Um, the difference between uh, so like um, easy would be like, let's say three, moderate would be four and hard would be five. So the difference between easy and moderate is one unit. To go to the next category, moderate to hard, it costs you two units. So you've exponentially increased. And, and all of a sudden you start seeing the word exponential increase and people go, oh yeah, that kind of makes a little bit of sense. Um, so again, I put my hard hat on and I go, yeah, because blood lactate goes like that. And so does like the individual relationship between force and velocity in a single isolated muscle and blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a lot of physiology that would, that would sort of back up and support that theory. Um, back it up a little bit and think about just general perception that we're talking. That exponential or power-like growth is a, 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 a pretty established phenomenon with any kind of uh, perception of intensity, so brightness and loudness and things like that. So if we're talking about just general perception of some intensity, and for us that's effort, we know that it, it has an exponential growth between the stimulus which is what you're given, you, how fast you're running, and the response, which is that perception of effort. Um, so it, it's, it has like those nonlinear properties, and then it's consistent with Borg's range model, whereby the bottom is, is zero, and that's absolutely nothing at all. 
Um, in athlete monitoring, by by definition, you would never get a zero because if someone's done some training and they truly felt it was zero, why am I even asking for an RP for that? In any case, because technically it wasn't training because there was no exertion, no effort. Some scales start at a one, but that's not consistent with having an absolute floor. And then obviously like a, a maximum category at the top. Like we said, you can bleed over to that absolute maximum, that black dot that theoretically you would you would never reach. So people spent, um, and Borg in particular, spent like years and years and years uh, rooted in psychophysiology and psychometrics, figuring out this stuff and developing it. And it's all there to be criticized or scrutinized, whatever. My argument is like, criticize it and scrutinize it once you've read it and read it all. Um, if not, you're just sort of like, it's like an argument in the pub and you're joining halfway through. And then like you back one person up and you actually realize that they're just fundamentally wrong for whatever reason. Um, so so when it comes like these modified scales and stuff, I'm like, okay, I understand Borg's motivations for it. And it took him, it literally took him over 50 years to do it. And then I see these modified scales that like come off the like conversations at camp at breakfast and people go like, ah, we've, we're really losing them a bit now. It's like three weeks in the camp. Should we start, should we stick a few emojis on the RP <laughs> scale instead? Just mix it up. Mix like it, it, up. Wouldn't be, it wouldn't be as literal as that. But I, I honestly think people look at it and go, hmm, bit fucking boring that could we should we chuck a bit of color on yeah let's chuck a bit of color on because you know you, you look at any color gradient and what's it going to do it's going to start at green it's going to go to amber go to red so you stick that on a perceptual scale and whether i'm looking at loudness brightness whatever automatically i go red means bad danger blood so i'm going to stay away from that like the plague whether i want to or not because that's the way my brain's working so i don't even know my brain's doing that green is desirable it's good it's go I'm attracted to that now already. So all of a sudden, forget about what the words and the numbers are. I'm just starting to base it on my perception of these colours. My perception of colour or gradient or hue might be different to yours and the next person and the next person. So so what you do here is you, you introduce features that automatically start actively encouraging other perceptions other than what we want to isolate. And we talked about it's already hard enough to differentiate between effort, exertion, fatigue, pain. So why add something else that just creates another ball ache amidst absolutely everything that I've now got to consider, like all of those aspects of conscious bias that we spoke about? Um, and it's chucking it on at, at sometimes, oh, well, it looks better. <laughs> I'm like, okay, it looks better versus um, someone spent half a life work trying to think about the best way to do this and tested it empirically and, and whatever um, and was a genuine expert in the field. Um, the, the other one is like emojis and faces, and that should be more obvious than colours because I think the paper that came out in the GSCR um, in Journal of Condition Research recently that looked at, at this stuff, they looked at the uh, validity of having a scale with emojis on it. Uh, it. I mean, it was a mess because they compared it to, to Borg's CR10 scale, which was a scale that was covered in colour and didn't have a fixed star, and it, had looked, like, it wasn't the CR10. Anyway, I, I was looking at what the emojis um, were. Like, what do you call that face? I just call it happy face. Or like, it was a different happy face. And I was like, what What do you actually call that emoji? So I was Googling it. I found the Emojipedia, which is an incredible resource if you've ever bought. And every emoji has a name. So I'm looking at all these facial expressions and it's like angry and slightly confused. Um beaming with joy i think one of them was called or like um sad the sad and sad and disheartened so all of a sudden i'm like you put these things on a scale and people are like oh well i thought it was easy but that's like oh so i thought it was really hard but that face looks disheartened and <laughs> i don't want to dishearten my coaches because i'm really enjoying in my training at the minute so i'll just float down there next to like beaming happy face <laughs> which, um, which player comes off and goes oh I'm very disheartened so disheartened very dis performance <laughs> <laughs> Roy I'm not angry I'm disappointed <laughs> so. Um, so you you, 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 you start chucking all these things on that actively encourage people to just distract them and think about other perceptions like the perception of that type of face or that colour or that gradient or whatever the other hidden um, danger with RPE scales is like borders so you'd get like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and there'd be a border around each category. And it looks like a load of Lego bricks stacked on top of each other when you when they're coloured from green to red with amber in the middle. What what we know is that RPE it, it's a perception. It's like your GPS samples at ten hertz, ten times a second. 
my perception of effort during exercise is a conscious sensation. It's sampling and I'm aware of it a billion times a second. It's a continuous measure. It should be able to, if there's a minimum and a maximum, it should be able to assume any number in the middle whatsoever. You all of a sudden show someone a scale where everything's in boards and boxes and you subconsciously tell them that the only possible responses are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You miss out your 5.5s or your 57s or your things like that. And again, I've used this analogy 10 times before. Imagine like Polar and First Beat are competing for, for your money, for your heart rate system. And I come in with my brand new heart rate system and it's all singing, all dancing. And people go, wow, it's so cheap. What's the catch? And I say, well, we'll give you a session average heart rate, but we round it down to the nearest 10. So if it was like 77% uh, of max, that's 80. And if it was 74% of max, that's 70. So now it's a 10% difference, even though it was only four percentage points of maximum sort of thing. And it's so easy to do that on a scale, like without without knowing it or not. So this is like, I, I just, um, sometimes I feel like, what's the point? But then sometimes I just feel like, no, no, it's so easy to get it wrong, but I feel like it's so easy to get it somewhere near right. Um, if you believe and trust in some of these scales, like the CR10 and the CR100 that were developed over decades with psychometric methods and from psychophysiological, the background of psychophysiology, linking the brain to the body. Um, so I, I, I lean on that and, and trust that and the evidence around that. And look, it's, it's, those scales aren't necessarily like, that's the, the finished product that we need to use. I've said and acknowledged this to quite a lot of people that I think they're the best option we've got at the moment. I think the principles that they have should be the basis for what we move forward with. I definitely think that there's scope to in, to improve them. Um, you know, for me, this is something that I'd love to start looking at to see if it's actually worth just sort of um, tweaking it a little bit to, to help, but it has to be done through a, a, a proper means and a proper way. So things like um, Borg's original CR scales would talk about um, uh, weak and uh, heavy, you know, as, as like, I would say easy and hard. Because if I'm in the weight room and I start using the word like, did you find that weak or heavy? <laughs> I'm a weak. I've just lifted, you know, X amount. That was, that was heavy. I'm, you know, um, so I, I want, I want my athletes to think about how it felt to lift that weight, not what was the actual heaviness of the object, as a, as an example. Um, so look, I definitely think the scope for maybe like refinement, but I, I genuinely believe that the CR scales are sort of the, the the current gold standard and foundation that we should be basing anything else that comes, be it practice or research on, on top of. Um, and you can get them for, you know, you can just head to borgperception.se. They're available there. You do need a, uh, there's a licensing fee to sort out. And this is because uh, Gunnar Borg ended up getting sued nearly because someone like keeled over on a cardiac test in the States, I think it was. And then it went to court and they were like, oh, well, the client or patient was reporting a low RPE and then all of a sudden they keeled over and had a cardiac arrest. And Borg was in like, Gunnar was in hot water with it. Um, th he wrote a letter about this and it's openly available to have a look at. And it's why he ended up copywriting the scales and saying, you need to obtain a license fee if you want to use my scales. Because we've had an instance where someone didn't use them properly. So this is like they bought the exact scale, but they didn't follow the instructions of how you should administer the scales. And then someone keels over on a CPET and I don't know whether they whether they died or not, but it got as serious as that. And there was like a multi-million pound lawsuit, all from numbers on a piece of paper. How easy or hard is that? So this is why I think like, you know, it, it's there to be taken as serious as you want. And I just think, again, there's that much to genuinely try and concentrate on with subject measures. Let the scale not be one of them issues because there's a pretty good one available at the moment already. So my next question is, we've had people on the podcast who have talked about subject, well, talked about RPE and have collected them at their respective clubs and decided to bin them, decide to move away and stick with their external measures and internal measures through things like heart rate. Is there anything that, and we've mentioned, it may just be a regurgitation of what you've just said, but is there any guidelines that you would encourage people to stick to to ensure that you don't get to that point where you go this is pointless we're putting too much time in the data we're getting is not good enough and again it might just be a pulling together of the last 45 minutes but there may be other things as well 
No, nah, I mean, I actually think that like having like being able to make those statements and have those questions is an important part of high performance sport and any sport. Like you've got to continually ask, like, are we is the juice worth the squeeze here? Mm. Because if it's not, um, I like that phrase. I'm a big fan of that phrase. Yeah, it's good, mm, isn't it? Yeah. It's really like you know, meat on the bones yeah. and like. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, uh, some, you know, people, uh, I, I sit here and sing the praises of RPE and defend it because I genuinely believe in it. I think there's better ways to do it than other ways. I think as a field, we could generally be a lot better than we could. And I feel that there's, that there's work to be done there that would, people would benefit from it. Um, but I'll, I'll be the first to tell you when that I have collected RPEs before and I've realized that it's not right for the environment that I'm in and I've like and I've stopped because the 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 effort to pardon the pun to actually get the good data is outweighed by um many like other things um I reflect back on my time at Hartlepool as well and like I was there as a bit of a one-man band as head of sports science medicine but um I was like entirely running all of the um SNC uh, sorry sports science while trying to oversee things from SNC point of view supporting the medical staff um and there was a lot more things at field than, than going on at the time than me being able to collect the data that I would have been happy making decisions on and when it got to that point, I thought, I, I owe it to my athletes here to not, like, I'm going to ultimately turn some numbers around. And interpretation of those might support um, a little bit of other information and, and some contextual information and my, my own wider intuition around what's going on to make a decision on that player. If I don't feel that, for whatever the data was, that I can trust it and rely on it, has at least been remotely accurate to the point where I'm happy to go in that decision-making process, then... Um, I just don't feel it's right to to do it, and and uh, yeah, I've been in situations before where actually the the to get the juice that I want, um, the squeeze would have been way too hard to the point where it would have distracted me from um, other things that I needed my attention a little bit more, and this is where like people always say um, the classic question is like. Oh well, if you could only collect one thing, what would it be? And everyone's going, I bet that knob edge is RPE. And I go RPE, <laughs> and then they go, No, no, but like, I'll give you twenty grand a year. Like, come on, what software do you want? And I'd like, if you if you're giving me twenty grand a year, back in hell, give me a part time sports scientist, and I can make this part of their um, responsibility, but also development to look after this, among other things. And if we talk about it in levels, if they can like do a lot of that ground level work and have genuine trust and belief in it, then on the next level above, which is a little bit closer to where the decision making with coaching happens, I can have more confidence in the data that, that we're using and that we're referring on. Um, but yeah, like I said, I've, I've been in situations before where I just thought I just can't manage this. Um, why did I drop RPE and not GPS? Uh, because it's very easy for me to now press one button that turns on all the GPS and press another button to turn it all off. And I'm doing my period live in any case. And I've got a nice little bit of code that gives me a little report on Shiny or Power BI. And that that's done. And it does it there. But I interpret that how I interpret my RPE. I'm always cautious with, like, the sprint data and can I trust it? Like, and if we're making changes, I'm like, oh, how many exposures above 90% this week versus last week? And is one or two really one or two? Or is it just a bit of error in measuring, you know, those velocities and counting effort counts? So... It comes as part of like wider discussions, but yeah, I just think that if 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 you genuinely feel that um, it's too much of a ball ache to um, uphold everything from the point of view, then definitely don't do it. If you feel that it's within your capability to make some probably quite simple and quick changes to try and improve the quality of the data you get, then definitely go for it. And we can just literally rattle them off. Like try using the CR scales, try showing it to an athlete's face and asking them the question. Um, see what response you get not only like the number but see if they engage with it see if they screw up the face see if they tut and roll their eyes or not because that tells you about what they actually believe in, in the process and what you're trying to do so then is does there need to be a bit of salesmanship and convincing them that no please like, take a bit of time on this just because you know um, and, and it's hard because like no one wants to be that nose or that knobhead who's like oh my god they're just bothered about the numbers and this that, and the other um the, it's a fine line between showing athletes that you care about stuff like that and coming across as like just you know a little bit of a hermit. Um, 
So there's a right conversation to be had at the right time with people. Stuff at the beginning of the season is always great to tee people up and set the expectation. Having coaches on board, um, what we know from um, uh, there's even some work from Emma Newport, um, the time I want my behaviour change in and around athlete monitoring. Um, and and th- there's not a lot of conclusive stuff you can say that this is going to be really good from a behaviour change point of view. Um, I spoke to Emma about this and she, she gave me some great reflections from some of the work she'd done. She said she genuinely believes that one of the biggest things when it comes to athlete monitoring uh, in general and adherence, compliance, um, rates, etc., is having the coaches on board and supporting your message. Um, so again, it, it can be really hard when you've got all the fancy tech and stuff, and all of a sudden it just looks like a really sort of, uh, you know, second thought off the back question: How easy or hard did you find it? Um, but it, it's 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 it again probably just comes back to how much do you do you trust and believe in it? And if you don't that much, then I, I probably wouldn't bother. I'd, I'd definitely say go all in or don't go in at all. Nice, mate. Well, we're coming up to the hour, and I think a good place to finish off is, you've mentioned a few there with the resources, but is there any other resources that people can, that you would point people towards to learn a little bit more about it so they can make a call whether they're in or out? Or any nuances around this area? Is there any particular papers, articles, videos, ref, um, resources? Uh, it, it can be tough and it's, it's probably one of the reasons why I'm quite interested in trying to drive it forward and, and when, when all of a sudden no one pays you to do research, the the, um, the tap that was once flowing is now all of a sudden dripping. So the, I, I found myself saying to people, um, just give me a bit of time more than anything these days. But I think one thing that we're, we're quite interested uh, in doing at the moment is actually making this a bit more accessible from what's out there from an RP point of view to your practitioner who just generally wants to go in and do the best, do the best job possible. Um, like something like the Borg Scales uh, book, the 1998 book or the Borg Scales folder, which is for free on Borg Perception, would be a great way to have a look about the actual um, nuances of this, the the scale itself and how to administer and how not to. Um, probably through lack of having anything else other than my own stuff off the top of my head at the minute, um, NSCA's Essentials of Sports Science. We we were um, lucky enough to to write a chapter for Duncan and Lorena on that in there. And, um, I, I really, in, in combination with Aaron and Franco, I really tried to go, here's all my thoughts on it at the moment, like to the point where this is literally what I would do and wouldn't do. And we try to give a lot of examples in there. There was a table towards the end about like situations that arise when collecting subjective measures questions that you would get off athletes and how you would typically try and respond to them or what's the best course of action a couple of like decision processes in there more about the administration um so yeah i mean i guess like yourself off the top of my head that that was probably um uh the motivation for writing that because we felt that there was a bit of a lack of like a one-stop resource for it um i still think there's more to be to be done and uh give me time bear with me (laughs) (laughs) And, and i'll have a crack um, but if anyone wants to uh, start paying me for it, that might be that helps, sure. isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Always for sure, helps. Yeah. <laughs> so, any so social media wise, where's the best place, mate? Twitter man. Oh, you, so, if you want to hear me mourning about RPE somewhere, <laughs> um, I'd not, like, but like people always say, and again, the, every I'm not one of them to like be sort of gobby on Twitter and stuff like that. I, I love I love watching the gossip, though. Mm. I love watching it. Um, but I never, I don't want to be that knobhead. But then sometimes you've got to go, fuck, if no one's sticking up for it, then who is like, and if RP is the little guy and then, you know, it's my job to maybe be there for the little guy. And it's not like being a dickhead about it. It's just when something gets shared with a coloured scale, like a paper saying, oh, it's now valid, going, it's actually not. And here's, in my opinion, the reasons why. Here's a couple of resources from smarter people than me that I think um, would would support that. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm like, I'm on Twitter uh, that's the only thing I use. Um, I'm sort of getting older and older now, and um, I, I never had Instagram because uh, I don't know. I just thought, Do you know what? It's one less thing I can not be asked flicking and scrolling through, and that's kind of been and gone now. And I'm definitely now in the generation of uh, we were on camp the other week. One of our 18s went, Sean, will you take a picture for us of me and the lads? And uh, I went, Yeah, yeah, no worries. And they're all sat there and they were like giggling. I thought, What's going on? And I took a picture. And they all started laughing, and they went, "Oh, you're on be real." And I went, "Oh, class, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's that, man?" <laughs> and uh, it's obviously this app where it takes a photo that way and that way at the same time, and what have you. Uh, so they were they were laughing because it's a nice photo, and there's one of my big snout looking down the camera. So 
Yeah, no, I, I try and just keep it simple, mate, On uh, and just go on. Uh, I'm just on Twitter. Uh, my handle on there is at Sean underscore McLaren1. McLaren um, spelled the same as the car. But oh, definitely don't, don't get into that now. We will save that for the video. <laughs> right, mate. Thank you very, very much. Really appreciate Cheers, that. It's, um, it's been a pleasure to chat to you in this on this medium and uh, dive into subjectives and RPEs and all that good stuff. So thank you very much. We'll chat soon and um, have a good evening. Thanks, Rob. Really appreciate you too, mate. Thanks, pal.